Okay, I'm having <clears throat> super rotten issues, I think, with police right now. I didn't have any issues with police, personally, until the moment that I discovered the surveillance. From the moment I've discovered the surveillance, the police have become a monstrosity to me. Um, and every time my feeling about the police as an entity lightens a little bit, I get slapped so hard, I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? Um, and it's not that the police are physically roughing me up or anything, but they're, um, unless I, unless I find out this is some, something other than the police doing this, then, you know, I will apologize and take it back, but I don't think it is. I think this is the police doing these violations. Um, so they're not physically roughing me up and they're not being rude to me or anything like that. What they're doing is re entering my apartment, destroying evidence. Um, and it's not just evidence. I mean, well, it is evidence because we're, we're talking about evidence of murders now. Okay. Murders, murders, murders. Um, oh my God. Vi just taking apart my whole life. Like, uh, uh, my photos are disappearing. Um, and not necessarily photos. They're not necessarily just photos that are related to the crime. They're family photos and things like that are just disappearing. Um, they feel completely, oblig you know, completely free to come into my apartment, even when I'm asleep at night, although I try, I'm trying to do things to prevent that if possible or make it a little inconvenient at least. Um, I, unfortunately, my door is set up on purpose, I believe, so that I can't put a lock, certainly not easily put a lock on the inside, that, like a bar lock or a chain lock. Um, but I had to leave my, you know, when Chris was here, usually I could make sure that one of us was home um, during the day. I can't do that anymore. I've had to leave the apartment. I've had to, you know, go do things occasionally. Um, so they feel totally fine coming to my apartment, going into lock lockers, anywhere that they can get into. And they probably are retaliating against me for complaining about them stealing my wallet or Chris's wallet. I don't remember. I don't know how much I've talked about this. If I've even talked about it on video, cause it's kind of in the whole scope of things is pretty a minor thing, but it, it's kind of the principle of it. And, and so I think we're at a, we're at, the principles are where, where we're meeting problems because my principle is I'm an American citizen and I am subject to all the rights, you know, I am, I get all the rights of an American citizen. And the 14th Amendment says this police, read the 14th Amendment. If you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen and that means all the protections of the Constitution apply to you and that, that is me and my daughter and it was Chris too. But they are accustomed to treating me like a, like a literal slave, like a slave, 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 like a sex slave, like a slave, period. Meaning I have no rights other than what they deign to give me. And <laughs> this is huge. This is freaking huge. Um, so... I had to go deal with Chris's, you know, death certificate, pick up his ashes, you know, and I have to, I have to do stuff like that sometimes, okay? I had to leave my apartment. I ended up having to get a locker box. It's not that they couldn't steal the whole locker box, but it's harder for them to actually pull out my hard drives and delete stuff off of my hard drives like they've been doing um, if it's locked in a box. Um... I end up carrying important paperwork with me, you know, like everywhere. But there was some stuff that I wanted to cover relating to the death of my dog in 1990. January 30th, 1991, my dog was murdered. Um, I mean, I guess at pets, you don't say murdered, but, you know, my dog was killed brutally, like brutally murdered. Um horrific incident and I was all by myself with you know it just sucked I mean I don't know now 
I don't know. I was I was by myself all the time back then, so it made sense. This is the first time I've been truly by myself since the early 90s, really. And even back then, I thought I had friends and stuff. Um, I had a job, you know. Now, I know that I don't have friends. My friends were all fake. Um, the only, th you know, I, other than my daughter, there's nobody that around me that hasn't been fake. So, um, and Chris, and Chris is now gone. Um, and he's been murdered. So what I was about to do just now, I was just trying to get it together to get the time and the energy to do this was to compare, because there's parallels running between what happened to my dog in the nineties and what happened to Chris. And these parallels were very deliberate. And, um, you know, I was trying to, uh, I'll show you. So, you know, I've had to try to make this case, you know, or not try. I mean, it should, it should be obvious to anybody that can think logically that, you know, these diagnoses of me are totally false. They're not unsupportable. Um, but it was necessary for me to, without asking permission, because I don't get permission, um, but, you know, this is, the law allows me to do this because my life's in danger, um, record these visits. Um So this last visit with Dr. Burns here, you know, I'm comparing, okay, I made a video of the visit, I showed his chart notes, and made commentaries on the chart notes. Um, so I say here, I suspect a link between Sean Burns, Becky White, and a link between Becky White and the horrible attack on my Siberian Husky, Tristan, in 1991. Um, I don't remember why I thought this at this time. But I still think this, um, and it's, I just, but, but the thing that was weird was to me was him taking this just sort of offhand comment I made about my dog dying. This isn't the exact quote, but you know, paraphrasing it as if it's putting quotes around as if it's an exact quote, um, about my dog dying from having his urine cut off. So um, they cut off my dog's urine flow until he died with implants. Now, I didn't know it was implants at the time, but I, I, um, ever since I met Chris, you know, he had difficulty often at night with urination, but he didn't seem to have any, like, um, other issues. Anyway, it was kind, it's kind of been a thing. But they started to do it to me, too. So, like... Um, they try to control me somehow. I'm not exactly sure I'm supposed to interpret it or even if I'm supposed to interpret it, but, um, my urine gets cut off with, you know, frequency based attacks. Um, well, you know, it's never so much that I'm in distress. It hasn't been, but it could be just like my heart. My heart has been fine, but then all of a sudden they created problems with my heart with the, um, you know, attacks through the implant near my heart. There's at least one implant near my heart, and I've detected it with a bug detector. Um, they scared the crap out of me with that thing. You know, um, last year around July, especially, I was in the hot. I was to the point where I was calling an ambulance, an ambulance, multiple times to take me to the emergency room because of these attacks to my heart. And then I get to the emergency room and they're like, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with you. Your heart's fine. You're healthy. But it's because I was being attacked with these frequency-based weapons. And I don't even know if they were telling me the truth. Like, they're trying to say they didn't say, see anything. But they're trying to say they didn't see cancer in Chris. But now I, I know that they knew that Chris had cancer. They put a giant mural across the street from us that said, but I'm never coming home. I was like, what's that about? And then other stuff was happening. But before even that happened, they were digging holes and, you know, they dig like three holes in a lawn or something like that. You know, it's like, this is your grave kind of thing. They were doing that kind of thing. The whole community was doing that. It's the same thing with the relapse attacks. The whole community knew about it. Imagine how I feel. You know, being told we're going to kill you. Asking the... You know, I don't ask the police anymore because, you know, they're too dangerous. But I, trying to ask the FBI to help, they too are dangerous, but they're more stealthy. I mean, I guess they are. I don't know. They're, they're definitely stealthy. Um, and just being told to fuck off, basically. 
So Sean Burns knew that they were going to do this to Chris. That recording, the you know, made that night with the green background, and then there was another one made a little later. Um, is Chris in agony because his urine, his ability to urinate and defecate has been completely cut off, and he has to go to the bathroom badly. Um, I mean, this cruel, this is just like the most unnecessary cruelty. Why would, and why do people just stand back and allow this to happen to us? He knew, this psychiatrist knew they were going to do this to us, you know, and he's sitting here while she's delusional, blah, 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 but, you know, then he said this, right? which in a sense was helpful because, I mean, it's evidence. You know, it makes me think the guy, you know, is in a total monster, even though this whole thing is mon a monstrosity. Um, I have good documentation, or I had good documentation of what happened to my dog, and I had avoided talking about it because it was so traumatic to me. And I was, since... What this was was a foreshadowing. We're going to do the same thing to Chris. We're going to harm. We're going to torture Chris as he's dying from this cancer that we caused. And we could have caught and done something about what we chose not to. You know, I mean, and then there are people are like, his sister has the audacity. Becky has the audacity, if that was really her, and it probably was, to get on my YouTube channel and ask me why I'm so miserable. This woman is cruel, manipulative and cruel. I have a whole box, okay? These are my journals. Every box is basically a year or a series of years. So I have... You know, all, the 1990s basically are in one box. The, or the early 2000s are in a box. The 80s are in a box. You know, these boxes are packed full of journals. And then, you know, um, you know, then I have a box, you know, for last year. You know, I've been keeping more now. So I have a box for last year. I have a box, you know, every, so there, I know, you know, basically what's here. But something's going on. So, for example, like, I opened this box, right? These journals should not be in here. This is from a different collection. So I haven't looked to see if there's some reason why these particular journals are in here. Um, but then this is also in here. It says Disciples of Rock and Roll. Okay, this is this guy, Michael Lund, that died in a fall while he was picking mushrooms. Why is that in there? Look at what it look at what it says on it. This is a cover to their record. Okay. Yeah, there's no record in there. So, I, I, I've called out the murders when they happen, but, you know, it's, it's looking more and more like it's the police doing the murders. Um, they're linked, they get, somehow, they get other people involved. I don't know why, like, okay, so I, I said Jason Moore killed Steve Hanford. But Jason Moore, you know, Jason Moore is an ex-convict, Steve Hanford also. So Steve Hanford's crime was he, you know, as an addict, he um, robbed a, a Walgreens for some oxycodone or something like that. Um, and he did his time. And then he was murdered with a heart attack. I'm not, I think that um, Jason Moore also did time for drugs. But so they get one convict to murder, one ex con to murder another ex con. But then, you know, this is all financed. And this is just, it's just so gross. These guys did their time, right? They did their time, but yet this goes on 
this is so unacceptable. Um, and the police were here, was it yesterday? Time is just, time is so weird to me right now. The police were here yesterday. I won't get into that later if we need to. But so, okay, so they have this whole box of 1990s. I'm going to show what it looks like right now. The police were here yesterday because I made a complaint to the police oversight board. And, you know, the fact that police retaliate against people who complain about police misconduct is a problem. Like, police, they're retaliating for everything right now. If you get on their radar at all, they appear to have, like, unlimited, you know, not maybe not unlimited. They've got a, you know, but they have too, way too much ability to retaliate against citizens. Um, and, and to retaliate covertly with these weapons um, that nobody's admitting that they have. They appear to be really, really, really attached to this assassination, attack, assassination, make people sick. Maybe that's the only reason people become police now. Maybe they don't really want to actually do police work. Maybe they just want to secretly attack people for money and power. Because the fact that they are allowed to do that at all, that they're going to attract people that are into that, is incredibly problematic. So, there were some key, you know, okay, so... The other day, I don't know why this is in here. Blue Dreamer. Maybe that's what it is. It could possibly have something to do with Doug. Doug Nash works for... Um, I'm assuming he still works for the same place. A bar that I believe is... I don't know if I'm correct or not, This, but I think that the bar that he works for might be owned by a former mayor of Portland. Bud Clark. I'll have to look into that and see if that's true. works in a bar in Goose, Hall Goose Hollow. So Bud Clark is the guy that, um, in the post, expose yourself to art poster. Flash in the statue. Portland. Um, that's a poster from 19, you know, early 70s. It was kind of, uh, you know, it was kind of popular in the early 70s. I think it was popular outside of Oregon. I saw it when I lived in Humble County. In fact, Guess who had it? it was Michelle DiCostanzo Crone. Um, there were several of these books. So a few, after Chris passed away, was murdered, I was aware, I, I, you know, I saw it happening, that they had done this parallel thing with my dog. So they cut off his urine and they were torturing him as he was dying this you know, horrible way. Um with these frequency-based weapons. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I've got to talk about this. I've got to... Because the thing about my... The thing that happened to my dog is I had dreams that predicted, like, exactly the stuff that was happening going to happen. Really, really accurately predicting what was going to happen before it happened. Then, after the dog died, I wrote a pretty detailed journal entry about what it was like. Um... So I was looking for that detailed journal entry, and it was in a notebook that looked like these. Um, this one's from 98. So wait, wait, wait. Most of these are from 90. Well, maybe not, because they're gone now. This one's 92, but I had a few from 90 and 91. Some buried ones that's down here. No, 96, 97. So the, no, like the early 90s are like totally missing. Totally missing. I had several from... I had 1990, 91. Um, and that's, those are the ones that I needed. And then some of the dreams I collected secondarily in another little notebook that, you know, you, you can see in some of my videos. It was like a small little spiral bound notebook that said Humboldt State on the front. So I, I read some of the videos, some of the dreams out of there on some videos. Um... That's that's gone. 
So what I had done was I took that little spiral bound notebook and maybe, I don't know if I had any more, any of these books, but, um, you know, I had a, I had a collection of stuff and I had stuck it in a box and I had put it, you know, here, right next to my bed so that when I, you know, had the energy and the time that I could go through and I could collect this and, and bring out this evidence because I want to show Chris was murdered. It's missing. All of the stuff is missing. That little notebook with all the dreams. And so um, I guess the point that I was trying to make is I wrote my dreams. A lot of my dreams I was writing in these spiral bound books, but I, at the time, because I was interspersing it with, you know, other types of creative writing, I thought I wanted to collect all my dreams in one notebook. So a lot of my dreams were written twice. Um, once in that little spiral bound notebook and then once in these other notebooks, all that stuff is gone. Both copies. The thing that was one of the things that was key was before my dog was, was murdered this way. I had a dream about a hot dog eating a hot dog. So that's, you know, 